So this starts our second day of BrewCon. Um, we have come a long way, and I'm not talking about yesterday's party for those who went there. Uh, I'm happy to see so many people awake today as well. Um, so yes, we have come a long way, and it will never be perfect. The industry has a lot of problems, and we have been doing a lot of things over the, the last couple of years, last couple of decades, to, to arrange the problems you have in information security, but still a couple of problems remain. Um, there's still issues that need to be fixing, and well, but we've done a lot of things to make the world a safer place. Um, Dave has a lot of years of experience uh, in, in uh, helping secure and, and changing the, the way the information security landscape is today. Um, he's the founder of Trusted Sec. He is one of the writers of the Metasploit uh, book. He is the creator of the Social Engineering Toolkit. And he's a contributor and, and owner, actually, or, or a creator of uh, Artillery. Um, we are happy, we are very happy to have Dave here today because this is one of the first years that BrewCon is not overlapping with DerbyCon. Um, so this is one of the only occasions we can have Dave here. Thank you, Dave, uh, Thank for you. this keynote. Um, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Well, good morning, everybody, and I appreciate you coming out here. I'm sure everybody uh, was uh, not drinking last night or having any type of fun. Um, so everybody went to sleep early and is ready for my, uh, for my talk today. Uh, but pleasure being out here. Uh, interesting enough, uh, my family, uh, my whole lineage of my family is all from Belgium. So uh, this is actually the first time I've been able to come out here. Uh, so it's kind of neat to see where a lot of my relatives and things like that were at. But uh, we got in la uh, last yesterday, so I didn't get to party too hard. I think I went to bed at like 10 o'clock or something like that. I'm getting old. Um, just a quick background myself, I, uh, I've kind of come through a long ways on the information security side. You know, I uh, started off more on the military side, uh, on the military intelligence side, uh, doing more crypto uh, type, type analysis and breaking crypto and, and those types of things, and then uh, got into the private sector and um, have been working there for a number of years. Um, I've been really fortunate, I got to do a lot of things on the media. Uh, I, I testified in front of Congress twice, and if you know anything about uh, US politics, it's really messed up, so I'll probably never ever do the whole Congress thing again. Uh, not, not, I don't know, it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't good. But uh, you know, we, I did a lot of good stuff around there. Um, but my, my passion's always been um, breaking things and figuring out how to fix things. And uh, that's kind of where a lot of the tools that I've written, um, the books that I write, um, all those things kind of spawn from. And uh, today I'll actually show you a new version um, of the Social Engineer Toolkit uh, that I just wrote, uh, actually on the airplane here, uh, that works on Windows 10 and everything else, which is going to be great from, a, from an exploitation vector. Um, but you know, everything that I do is really try to make the industry better and, and kind of going from there. I also started a conference called DerbyCon, which I'm really glad that it didn't conflict because uh, it's great to be here. And I know Wim's been trying to get me here for a number of years, and it's always been kind of hard. I saw I see a couple, couple of folks with uh, some DerbyCon shirts. That's always great to see. Um, but really, you know, I uh, started two companies uh, about four years ago, um, and uh, they've been going well. And we kind of focus on the information security side. But if you look at uh, security today, you know, for me it's been interesting because you look at uh, kind of when I started and, uh, you know, I, I came in at a really young age on the military side. I remember doing DEF CON at uh, Alexis Park, you know, and I think it was 1999. And, uh, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, it's kind of a tight-knit community and we're all kind of brainstorming and figuring things out, but it was really, really small. And you didn't have dedicated groups to security. You didn't have folks, you know, focusing on security as far as organizations go. And then you see a lot of things start to change. And, um, you know, I, I was just at DerbyCon, there was a, a keynote panel um, that had, you know, Nickerson and Ed Skotis. And I think Ed keynoted here a couple years ago, didn't he? Ed Skotis, I think, yeah. And uh, another phenomenal uh, person, and Katie, and a lot of the other folks. And uh, there was a big debate on, on kind of where InfoSec was headed to. And, and that's what I'm going to kind of be talking about today, looking at where we're at right now, um, some of the ways that, that we're seeing a lot of these things, and ultimately how do we get better and kind of improve on what we've done, because we have accomplished a lot. And what's interesting to see is, uh, they may follow Mr. Robot, they may watch the show Mr. Robot at all. Um, it's actually interesting to see how, how, portray, uh, how hackers are kind of portrayed. And it's, uh, it's really interesting because it's, it's you know, um, Mr. Robot's a relatively accurate portrayal of, of kind of the hacker mindset. And what I thought was really interesting is one of the episodes, I think it was like episode three, 
um, or four, you know, um, Elliot, the guy that's the, the main actor in the, the TV show, you know, talks about, hey, I can't just get into something that I never hacked before. I have to research what I'm going after. I have to figure out an attack vector to, to get in. I think they're trying to break into a prison. And so he was able to find a, a bug in, in the um, police, you know, the police uh, vehicle and through Bluetooth or whatever and hack into there. But um, it's kind of interesting to see how we're being portrayed now, um, you know, as far as having to do research. It's not like we can just hack anything or break into anything. It requires some sort of, of, of knowledge as an attacker and some skill level to actually go after what we're going to be targeting. And uh, that's kind of what we're seeing as being kind of, kind of changing is where the industry is really focusing a lot on automation and automating hacking and automating defenses and, and detecting hackers in an automated fashion. Whereas, you know, in, in, in all eventuality and reality, it's a lot different than that. What was also really cool is, uh, I don't know if everybody saw episode five, but uh, when they're hacking into Steel Mountain, uh, in episode five, they, uh, they're social engineering a lady, and they're actually using the social engineer toolkit, which I wrote, uh, to actually hack into Steel Mountain, which is really cool. So I remember just seeing my tool you know, being used in a TV show was kind of neat. Um, but hey, whatever. And they were actually using a really old version, uh, and that feature wasn't even in the, the newer versions of Set anymore, which is kind of interesting. But, um, so you know, if you look at, at kind of the history, right, you know, the, the, times, the types of security that we've had out there, We've now moved to more interconnected of everything, you know, um, the Internet of Things and focusing on having everything connected to us real time, which is phenomenal and great from a technology perspective. And security is never something that should stop or be in the way of technology, uh, which is where I think a lot of us have, have really t uh, traditionally focused on. If you look at kind of the old methods of, of protection, you know, our goal was to kind of stop things a little bit and see if it could, you know, be secure or if it, there's ways for us to, to get into things. And really, we can't do that anymore. Technology moves so fast um, that it's almost impossible to stop a lot of the, the methods that we see today um, for technology to advance. And um, I always look at, um, at the ratio to security folks um, to IT. I mean, is anybody, and I don't know if it's, it's the same in the, is, I'm sure it's the same in the United States as is everywhere else, but, you know, I mean, how many IT people do you generally have to a security person? You know, it's usually, you know, 200, 300 IT folks to one security person or maybe a half a security person or maybe you have, you know, a few folks dedicated to security. Um, but most of the time, the ratio to security to um, IT or the ratio to security to actually secure the organizations are significantly lower than what you actually need to do. And that's interesting. And so you look at, at hacking today and what interests me is, is the types of methods that we see on the breaches and we see and how they're actually going after it. Um, you know, when you look at the media, you have certain companies that, that, that kind of embellish, I guess, how hackers are breaking into corporations. And, it's, and they make it seem like it's a highly sophisticated type of, of, of attack. And if you look at Sony, for example, like it looks like you know, the, the type of malware that was written for Sony looked like something that a nine-year-old could have written. And uh, you know, it was something that was really basic. Um, you know, it was like nine different binary droppers and using commercial tools to kind of mix into it. It was, like a, it was a hack job to destroy a company. And those are the types of techniques today that we see. They're not heavily sophisticated. In some cases, they are. Um, but in most cases, the 99% you know, of the breaches that you see out there really result in things that are just trivial for attackers to get into. And so right now, we have a, a, a perception that hackers are awesome and that all hackers are breaking into computer systems and they're using zero days and all this other stuff. And so you have companies focusing on these types of techniques to try to protect themselves when you know, they're using basic passwords and not patching their systems and everything else. So we have a major gap right now. And if you look at 99% of, of, of the breaches out there, it literally resides on leaving the front door open. You know, I mean, I, I'm a pen tester. I break into companies every single day. Um, and 99% of the time, the way that I get in is through something stupid, right? It's a default password or a missing patch or somebody clicked a link that they shouldn't have. Um, they're all simple techniques of getting into an organization. I can't remember the last time I had to burn a zero day to get into a company, even a good company that has you know, good security practices. 99% of the time, it's something basic and stupid that gets me into a company. And you know, the, the fact is, is that we're focusing on APT prevention tools and all of this other stuff when our, our admin password is, is something weak and ridiculous that makes it easy to get into. Um, we were just doing a, a pen test for our company recently. And um, you know, main website, first thing we tested in the, the input, one of the input fields in the search field was uh, uh, it had SQL injection on it. The, the web application was running as an elevated account, which gave us access to the inside network. And then from there, we compromised the move laterally and got access to the rest of the environment. Like basic, basic stuff, you know, stuff that we've been knowing for 10 or 15 years that are problems. And those are the issues that we still experience today. And my favorite topic is, is end users. And I'll show you an example of, of one of the techniques that I really like to rely upon now. That's like my new uh, Java applet method, which I'll talk about in a second. 
But for me, end users are by far the easiest way still, right? And I've talked about this in a lot of other talks before in the past, and it's nothing new. But I mean, if you just spend 15, 20, 30 minutes developing something that's somewhat believable, someone is going to click it. And I don't care if one person clicks it, or five people click it, or six people click it. I just care that I get one person to open up something that I need so that I can get access to the rest of the infrastructure. And that's kind of where we're at right now. I mean, our entire security premise is based off of one user. One user in the company can completely make a, a, a complete downfall and cataclysmic effect of an entire organization. And to me, that's a problem. I mean, if, if one user can click a link, it compromises their machine and it goes undetected, which going undetected is very trivial. Um, you know, that, that's what our security premise is based off of. And that's where most of the breaches happen. And so you saw that, you know, uh, if you look at kind of the history of, of InfoSec, right, you saw a lot of these breaches happen and you saw a lot of these things happen. And so we develop, you know, a cybersecurity team, which is supposed to combat um, these types of threats. The problem is, is that cybersecurity teams are built off of, you know, existing and legacy, um, you know, sins of the past or, or whatever, um, where you have a lot of issues that, that are really been out there for a number of years, and we're supposed to fix and clean up all of the issues that companies have done in the past. And I'm going to show you an example here um, of the newest version of the Social Engineer Toolkit. So I'm going to load my Windows 10 machine, but um, I want to show you here really quick. Let me blow this up a little bit. All right, can everybody see that? So one of the main methods that I typically do um, to get access to new companies, I'll literally spend probably you know, a half hour, 45 minutes researching uh, one to two people inside of a company. And usually, you know, I can do more than that, but uh, one to two people is usually my easiest. And as an industry right now, you know, when we do social engineering, everybody's like, oh, we want you to do sampling of our, our, our infrastructure, right? We want you to, you know, see how many people will click a link so that you can track statistics. That's not a real world example of, of what an attacker is going to do. And um, ultimately, when I look at, at an attack, I try to find one or two people that I think are decent in the company that may have elevated rights or may have you know, access to systems that I need access to. Um, and then what I'll do is I just go to LinkedIn or I'll go to their social media sites. I'll take a look at them. And then I usually spend about a half hour, 45 minutes, just kind of looking at them and what they do and that type of thing. It sounds kind of stalkerish and creepy, but uh, it does work. Um, sometimes it gets really stalkerish and weird because I like find like weird things about them and I start like you know trying to figure those out. But um, in most cases, what I usually do is is I'll, I'll spend about you know a half hour on an individual, and then I'll craft an email up or something that looks believable, um, a website or whatever it ends up being, and I develop my whole pretext or my attack off of somebody based off of that. And what I enjoy about that is, you know, like I used to do um, a lot of exploit research, and um, you know I haven't done that as much um, over the past year or two. And what's fun about this is it's like almost a new zero day every single time. You know, when you attack a human, you're attacking a flaw in them or you're trying to make them believe something. And so it's kind of fun to com completely create something that's completely ridiculous, that makes no sense whatsoever, but it does to them. And so a lot of cases, you know, you can do things that, that are normal business operations, like, hey, you know, you have to do this based on, you know, company policy or whatever. But a lot of times I try to impact them in ways that are, are personal to them. And so, you know, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll create a, you know, a website that, that they go to and they visit, and I'll send an email to them, or I'll even call them up on the phone. Phone calls are the best. Uh, phone calls are the easiest way because you can establish rapport very quickly. And, and, and most of us in the, uh, the security field are kind of the, the nervous, antisocial type, um, but I really enjoy just picking up the phone, calling somebody, and saying, hey, this is so-and-so, can you go to this and fill this out really quick because we need this for some sort of reason. And it's usually really fast and quick, um, and it makes it, you know, that, that um, level of rapport um, is almost established immediately based off of just a phone call. And if you can uh, couple, like, phone spoofing or something like that on top of it, it's even easier. You know, if you come from a trusted number or somewhere inside of the company, it makes it even better. So uh, in the social engineer toolkit, I'll go to um, option one. And by the way, I'll be releasing uh, this new version later today. Um, but uh, this works on Windows 10 um, and everything below. What was nice about Windows 10 is um, they actually put in some um, additional protections around PowerShell injection, uh, which is one of the main methods that I use uh, for exploitation. If you're not familiar um, with PowerShell injection, um, you know, a lot of folks went through like application whitelisting and like bit nines and things like that, right? Um, and so dropping, you know, binary droppers is kind of a, a way of the past in my opinion. I haven't actually dropped a binary in a system probably for a few years. And uh, one of my favorite methods is what we call PowerShell injection, which, you know, what's great with Windows XP end of life is now you're guaranteed a reliable exploitation method on Windows. Um, so what you can do with PowerShell is you can um, directly uh, inject uh, shellcode into memory, 
without ever touching disk, which is phenomenal, right? So you can put whatever you want to in memory and spray whatever you want to in memory all through PowerShell. Um, it allows you to do that real time. And uh, traditionally, the way that I used to do that is through uh, what was called a Java applet method. And so we know that Java is installed on a lot of uh, machines, and you have the ability to exploit that. But in a lot of cases, if you don't know um, that Java is installed on the machine, there's also a uh, few other great methods that are out there uh, available. And uh, Justin over here actually uh, brought me into one of the ones which are called HTA um, attacks, which is one, uh, a new method that's available inside a set. And so what happens when you run this, this, this attack um, is it'll inject PowerShell directly onto the disk. It'll shoot it into memory, and then it gives you your shell, whatever you want it to be, um, out of the network, and then you have full access to the computer. Um, and it bypasses or circumvents, I guess, execution restriction policies, which really isn't much. Um, you know, that's not really a security mechanism. But it allows you to basically have a one-liner that, that allows you to compromise the system uh, without having to touch disk. So we'll go to the website attack vector, which is number two. And then the new method is number eight, uh, which is the HTA attack method. Now, there's a lot of good ones out there. One of my favorites is actually um, it was what, what's called the web jacking method, um, which uh, basically um, makes you believe that the certain site is there, and it um, takes, takes advantage of uh, uh, what you consider like the hover uh, attack. But there's a number of different methods out here that you can use. I don't typically run exploits anymore. Uh, you don't really need to, to exploit a machine anymore because, I, for me, exploits, you know, you have to profile the machine. You have to make sure that the version's correct. You have to make sure the operating system's correct. You have to make sure you got everything perfect when you go and you launch an attack. And it just takes a lot of time. I um, mean, if you have that time, that's great. If you want to focus on targeting an individual user, have them come to your, your site first and kind of profile their browser and see what versions they're using, and then from there, you know, selectively grab an exploit, that's fine. Um, but in most cases, I don't ever really typically run exploits anymore because there's so many things available inside of Windows anyway that you don't have to actually exploit and just trick a user to do to get remote, uh, remote code execution that you don't really need to run a specific exploit. And so I'll hit number eight, which is the HGA attack method. And then it'll want my IP address. So I'm just going to type my IP address in here real quick. And then uh, what port? I'll do a reverse HTTPS for Metasploit. It's going to take a second. It's going to generate the shell code. It's going to wrap that around into um, a PowerShell, the PowerShell injection technique. It's going to encode it. It's going to cast it Unicode and then Base64 encode it. And then I'll just clone a website. Now, if I was doing a pretext, you know, I would do something. You know, I build, either build my own website or use, you know, um, Amazon or something or you know whatever I want to do in order to um, use my pretext to get around something. Um, but it'll go and clone the website and inject everything into that new uh, method. And then it launches and it creates everything. And then it'll automatically start Metasploit for you. So once Metasploit launches, we'll have our listener. And we'll be ready to go. Now, if you didn't know this, by the way, uh, the way the uh, Metasploit Meterpreter Handler works um, is the first stage, there's what's called a first stage and second stage. First stage is the, the basic stage that is kind of the, uh, the shell, and the second stage is, what, you know, is, is where the rest of your information is at. If you didn't know this or not, uh, the reverse HTTPS um, handler actually goes out and pulls a binary, uh, which if you have any type of web content filtering software, like you know, anything that stops binaries, um, it'll actually go and block that. You can get around that really quick if you want by typing, hang on. If you do set enable stage encoding to true, that actually um, mangles the uh, second stage um, into what's called Shikata Guy Ne, which is an old encoding uh, platform, which gets picked up by antivirus. But since it's over the wire, it doesn't get picked up by anything. And if you're like, trying to get around Palo Altos or things like that, it also works very well with those. So if you just hit Enable Stage Encoding and True, it mangles the second stage completely over the wire. Um, and you have nothing to worry about. So I'll go ahead and run that. And so when we go and run this um, on the Windows machine, If I go and use the new Edge browser, which is ultra secure, right? Just don't, it's IE just rewritten, right? Um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll go to this, this website that I, I created here in just a second. Um, but what will happen, and, and, and here's the thing. Um, you're going to see that I'm going to have to hit open on something that launches, right? Um, in the older versions of Windows, like uh, Windows 8, uh, Windows 7, it actually pops up and says, do you trust Microsoft? You're like, well, yeah, I trust Microsoft, and you hit allow, right? Windows 10, there's actually an additional step you have to hit run. But what I usually do is I just build these, these, these clicks that a user has to go through into my pretext. So I'm like, hey, just so you know, when you visit this site, we need to verify your computer. So make sure you hit run or whatever and open it up. And do you trust Microsoft? Of course you do. So I'll go to this website. 
And notice it loads the website itself. It's going to run a security scan really quick on the, on the, on the, on the file itself. And then it's going to want to run. And you get this little pop-up here. And it goes and executes uh, the, the, the little pop-up there you can actually get rid of. But uh, once you're there, you can either redirect back to the legitimate site itself. Or back here, you get your interpreter shell. And it works perfectly fine on Windows 10. And you don't have any, um, uh, anything touching disk, which is great. So that's the new method uh, inside a set, but the new version is now, now supports Windows 10, which the PowerShell injection technique and the memory injection uh, works perfectly fine. What was interesting is that um, with 64-bit with platforms, um, there's, there's an interesting uh, fact where like, if you're trying to you know, compromise a 32-bit system and a 64-bit system, you need to you know, have uh, independent shell code uh, for 64-bit platforms or 32-bit platforms. So what I did is I, um, I figured out a way to automatically detect if you're in a 64-bit or 32-bit platform within PowerShell, and I automatically downgrade the process to a 32-bit process, and then I inject native 32-bit shell code into memory. Um, so it allows you to basically compromise a 64-bit or 32-bit platform natively without having to use um, different pieces of shell code, which is awesome. Um, so it allows you to just, you know, one command line string argument, uh, which is, and by the way, if you're interested, like, if you ever get anything that's like remote, uh, remote command execution, I'll show you. Let me see if it's out of here. It would be under launch HTA. So it's just this, this command right here. You notice that it's just a, a um, string right here. I'm just launching command ID C with a, a command, and then PowerShell, the Windows hidden uh, encoded command. And this command here is just, um, it's just uh, cast Unicode and then base64 encoded. You, if you have anything that you can copy and paste into or, or run a command on, you can get PowerShell injection natively. It's just the, you, you paste it into that window and it executes and gives you your shell. So you don't have to drop binaries. It works really well with, uh, if you've used uh, Metasploit, uh, Metasploit's PSExec, right? PSExec is rough because it actually starts a service and creates a bi uh, drops a binary. But PSExec underscore commands um, allows you to specify our host, which allows you to spray multiple, the whole network. And you can just paste that command line in there and then you just get shells you know, coming back to you without ever having to touch disk, which is really nice. So there's a lot of really cool ways of, of getting around most of the stuff that's out there. And we got our shell. So we have full access to the computer. Now, my, uh, the Java applet method is still um, pretty successful. A lot of times what we'll do uh, when we're going after um, you know, an individual, we'll have multiple redundancies and failbacks. So what I'll usually do is I'll run the Java applet uh, first, and I usually use like a, a, a code signing certificate for that. So I'll usually have like a, a company name like verified or, or you know, verified secure or whatever. Um, and then if that fails, it, it falls back to the HTA method. And if that fails, it falls back to harvesting credentials so that you can hopefully hop on something like a VPN or OWA or something like that. Um, so there's a lot of different ways of getting around it. But in that case, you know, one user is the whole downfall of an entire organization because now that allows me now to compromise a system and then move laterally to the rest of the environments, which is really important. And that's what you see, right? I mean, you see one person become compromised or a one server become compromised or something else. And there's enough information on that system that allows me to then kind of piggyback and move laterally into a lot of other systems. And that's kind of our model of security right now. We compromise one Windows machine or one Linux machine, and that allows us to get access to multiple other machines, which is a very bad state. And so, you know, the history of cybersecurity, what we do and what we're taught to do, you know, is start to build a castle, right? We build a castle and it has archers and drawbridges and everything else in there, and then we build these heavily fortified walls with firewalls and everything else so we could pr protect hackers from, from coming um, on the inside. And that's a great mentality if we didn't have like mobile devices and BYOD and everything else that starts to hit us. And then all of a sudden now we have cloud movements and IOT and everything else that starts to happen, right? And now our castle mentality is, is basically nothing. We're, we're completely wide open, or the drawbridge is down and everybody's allowed in and out. And now we're supposed to protect everything, right? And so it's interesting in security where we've morphed from, from that castle mentality to, hey, we're allowing everything on you know, at any given time uh, we have to figure out a way to make that work in security. It's a really um, hard position to, to work, uh, work on. And then the problem is, is that we're such a new industry that we don't have the talent yet. Right? I mean, InfoSec is a very, very new industry. I mean, I would say over the past 10 years, it's grown 
like 3,000%. I mean, if you, if, I went, if you went from DEF CON in you know, 1999 or 2000 and had 200 people there to DEF CON, which now has 25,000 people, that's a pretty big statistic, right? So we now have folks dedicated to it, and now we don't have a lot of talent out there to pull from. And so companies now struggle with, hey, who do I hire? How do I hire? How do I build that talent up? Do I build it in-house versus outside? Do I use a consultant? And now, you know, everybody starts like, oh, hey, I need to hire for information security because it's important. And so we start hiring for information security, and then we start seeing a lot of breaches happen where you can weaponize attacks, where you can go after companies and cause financial loss. You can cause intellectual property theft. You can cause credit card breaches, whatever it is. And so management starts to freak out, right? They're like, hey, this isn't good. We need to figure out a way to stop this and prevent it. And so now you're the person that's supposed to stop and prevent all this, and yet, you know, you're supposed to be in meetings, um, you know, deal with, you know, having to secure every single um, piece of technology on the infrastructure. You now are sitting in, in, in countless meetings of how you're going to protect this infrastructure and that architecture, architecture, and now you're overloaded in an environment. And I'm, I'm from that environment. I came from uh, where I was a, a chief security officer for a really big Fortune 1000 company in the United States. And so, you know, you're, you're in this cyclical effect of where you, you're supposed to put out every fire that you possibly can, and yet you don't have the talent that you need, or you don't have the people that you need, or you do have the people you need, or you're part of that, that um, uh, type of, of program, but it's very difficult to keep under control. And then the company literally starts to throw money at you. They're like, hey, here's a million dollars. Here's two million dollars. Here's three million dollars. Here's ten million dollars, right? Do what you can to protect our organization. And we created a really weird uh, industry because we went from like the days of like, well, hey, hey we're going to have antivirus and stuff like that, and that's cool, to we birthed the whole industry around technology. And what happened was we have, you know, 15, 20 years of, or 30, 40 years of neglecting security within an organization. You have flat network architectures, and you have all of these legacy systems that you have to support, and all of these different areas. And now, you know, opening up our castle mentality and allowing everybody in. And now we have all this money. So what do we do with all this money? Well, normally what we would normally do is, is try to build a security program, right? Because now we have the visibility of the company and say, hey, we have to build a structure around our program. But now we have all this money. We have to spend this money. So we don't have enough people, right? But we're not going to be able to hire people for some reason. It's weird. Like, we have enough money, but we can't hire people. So we're going to buy technology, and we're going to buy technology to solve our problems because technology is going to fix all the issues that we've been neglecting for 50 years, or for 20 years at least. And so we go and we buy these products. And does anybody know what happens when you buy products when you don't have enough people? It just kind of sits there, right? And what's great is like, hey, we've had this PIX firewall here. I mean, we moved to an ASA, which is great. But we need to get next gen. So we can go and we buy this Palo Alto, right? Because Palo Alto is going to save us. And Palo Alto has this great rule importer from ASA. And what we do is we take 20 years of shit and then we import it into Palo Alto so hoping it's going to fix it. Right? And now that's our security. So we have 20 years of crap and then we just put 20 years of crap into a brand new system that we didn't just, you know, because it's too hard to redesign our architecture. It's too hard to say, hey, our sales folks shouldn't be talking to our marketing folks. Our marketing folks shouldn't be talking to R&D and R&D shouldn't be talking to our servers. It's too hard to do network segmentation. So we're just going to pop all that stuff in there, and it's going to hopefully be good. And by the way, all of our guys that are experts at ASAs now, now need to be experts in Palo Altos. And they're already overloaded, and now you just put a whole new system in their infrastructure. I'm sure that program's going to go great. But now we got this Palo Alto, and everything's fine now. It's, everything's running. We, we, we downed the network for like five days, and we had a whole bunch of things break, but we're fine now. Now we're going to go buy some APT prevention tool, right? And so now that Palo Alto is over here, now we're focusing on this APT prevention tool. And we also have DLP over here that we got to do too. And we also have this new next gen, you know, you know, endpoint software stuff that we need to figure out because antivirus is dying. But we don't have enough people, so I just did DLP kind of, so I'll leave that over here. And I'll start working on this now, and I'll leave that over here, and I'll start working on this now. But we spent all this money now, so we're better, right? What cracks me up is when we do pen tests. And they have these, this, you know, you, you, you look at their server racks and you see all the big name brands in there, right? You got your awesome sim, you got, you know, you got your fire eyes and you got all this other stuff, right? And it's all sitting there doing wonderful magic for you, right? And we go and we break in and we didn't even notice any of that technology's there. Like, hey, we got access to everything. You're like, hey, well, did, did Bit9 stop? I'm like, I didn't know you guys had Bit9, I'm sorry. And it's not the technology's fault, it's just you have no program around it. I mean, technology to help out on certain things are great if you have a program in place. 
But if you don't have a program in place, and you focus on technology over talent, that's a big problem. We as hackers don't care what you have in place. We're going to figure out a way around it. It's whether or not you can detect us as we're going and doing it. And what I love about um, this industry is that you know, the media itself and, and, and kind of what we create in the InfoSec industry spawns a lot of the technology that happens. And it's a multi-billion dollar industry. I mean, people are making tons of money off of us right now. It's insane. And what cracks me up is you now have you know, um, companies that are like, oh, it was a heavily sophisticated attack and it was originating from China or North Korea or wherever it was, it doesn't matter. And you need to buy our product in order to solve your issues. And what, what's interesting is, if you, has anybody ever looked at a lot of the, the sandboxing technology out there, the stuff that, that you know, basically the way it works is um, whether it's a, a, a website and you're downloading a file from a website or if it's a email coming into your infrastructure and inspects the email, what it does is it, it takes that, uh, that, that whatever that, that email is or that website is and it puts it in a sandbox, right? And it says, okay, you're now inside my sandbox. What is going on when I go to this website or what is going on when I go to this specific system? And it virtualizes and it says, okay, well, hey, it's making modifications to the registry. It's making a call out. This looks like some sort of malicious behavior. I probably wouldn't recommend from a reputation perspective to allow you to, 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 to allow this to run. I'm going to block it, right, because it's an attack. It's kind of how the, the, the newer technology works, right, the, the sandboxing stuff. Now, what's funny about the sandboxing stuff is they're still no different than, than what we would consider antivirus. They're still very much signature-based, even though they claim behavior. They work off of specific rules that they deem a specific reputation or not, and then from there they either allow you or don't allow you. So if you know those rules, or if you know the environments that they put themselves in, it's very easy to get around those. So for example, a lot of the virtualization technology, if you sign it with a legitimate code signing certificate, which, by the way, is really easy to get a code signing certificate. If you don't know, it's like 300 bucks, you're good. Then you're good, your reputation exponentially increases, and most of the time, even if it's making a callback, allows you to get, get around it. Now, one of my favorite ones, which is the most ridiculous and simplistic one to get around most of the virtualization technology out there, is three lines of code. Well, it's actually two lines of code. I guess if you consider the import uh, a, a line of code, but. Um, most sandboxes are very predictable environments. So for example, um, I would say out of the five ones that I've tested, all of this works here because what they do is they try to um, uh, maximize how many uh, types of, of, of things that they can inspect at a given time. So they try to optimize their environment so that you can take something in, digest it, and then spit it out really quickly in a business environment so you have you know, um, more and more room to, to work with. And so the way that it works is they, they, they virtualize themselves in a sandbox, and those sandboxes are very predictable. When I say very predictable, they're usually using less than two CPU cores. Does anybody in your environment, any user, or any server, or anything else that you have in your environment use less than C in two CPU cores? No, right? And if it was, I'll be honest, I don't want to hack that machine. That's a slow-ass machine, and I got more things I can, I can hack into other people's machines that are better than that. I'm not, work, I'm not dealing with a one CPU core machine. I'm a little bit picky as a hacker. Um, so if you run into this, all you need to do in your malware that you're writing is say, hey, if I'm running in less than two CPU cores, then just exit and don't do anything. So when the code comes in and your little virtualization APT you know, prevention tool 10,000 inspects this, it says, hey, what's going on? Hey, is it, are you doing anything bad? Nope, nope, I'm in less than one CPU. I'm fine, bro. I'm good. It's like, oh, you're good. It sends it off. And then as soon as I'm in an environment that's more than one CPU, I'm like, hey, hey, I'm in more than one CPU. I can finally hack somebody now, right? And then it sends your shell back, and you get full access to the computer. So most of this technology that you see out there, and whether it's um, you know, application whitelisting, I mean, I'll be honest, application whitelisting, I don't even recognize that it's on a machine when I'm, when I'm hacking it, because I don't ever really write a binary to a system. There's no need to. Or a code sign it you know, afterwards just to make sure everything's good, and it's fine. So either way, most of these technologies that we see out there are layers, I agree. But most of the time, it's trivial to get around these layers. And so what we focus on now in security is automation. And this is a, was a big discussion point with that, that DerbyCon panel. And we've been trying to automate ourselves because we don't have enough people right now to help. And so you have source code analyzers and web scanners and vulnerability scanners and you know, tools that say they can perform pen tests and all this other stuff because they need to automate the human aspect. And a lot of those do help. Um, you know, I'm not going to say that uh, a vulnerability scanner doesn't help. They help for vulnerability management. They help you get rid of the low-hanging fruit. Those are great, uh, great things. Source code analyzers are great to get you some quick visibility and some of the, the low-hanging fruits. But vulnerability scanners find maybe 40%. 
30%, if that's a good number, around what we find as pen testers, as human beings. So when you talk about skills, it's like, hey, robots someday are going to replace human beings. That, that might be the case. We might have a Skynet day someday. I don't know. But we actually need people that are talented, that actually focus on research, that actually focus on the types of attacks, because that's what the hackers are doing right now. I mean, you, don't, I mean, you might have hackers running vulnerability scanners today, but most of the, the attacks that you see, I mean, it's still the simple stuff. And they are hackers. They figure out those things, and they break into stuff. Automation isn't going to actually solve or make anything um, around that. And Chris, uh, I, don't know, I don't think he's here right now, but Nickerson said a good story or, uh, at DerbyCon. And he said, when are we going to, uh, going to be the John Henry versus the machine? And we're already starting to see that. And if you don't know uh, the story, it's John Henry. He was an uh, uh, individual who was trying to beat a uh, machine. And basically, he it was able to beat the machine, but he ended up dying at the end because he was so stressed out. Um, his heart was so stressed out from trying to beat the, the machine at the time. And if you look at our industry, um, we're kind of moving to that route where, where we're trying to automate us as much as possible. And when is it going to be a point to where you know, the machine itself ends up beating, uh, beating us? And I don't see that happening anytime soon. You know, what I look at is I see the industry itself focusing on, and, and what was interesting, uh, I'll talk about this in a second, but uh, the industry has a way of fixing itself. If something isn't working, we're going to see more breaches. And we're seeing more breaches right now, right? So we have to fix ourselves in some way, shape, or form, or we're going to continue to see more and more. So if that's automation, if automation ends up fixing that, then fantastic. But if it doesn't fix itself, and we still see more breaches, we actually need skilled people to do things, that's, that's going to be what's happening. Now, about the automation piece, what was interesting is just yesterday, um, Amazon, and, and, and HD was part of the panel um, at, at Derby, and, and uh, we're talking about the whole automation thing and, and how um, you're going to run into a lot of these commoditized companies, the, the businesses that, that kind of focus on things. And HD posted a thing yesterday. I wonder how many InfoSec business models were killed today uh, from Amazon Inspector. If you're not familiar with Amazon Inspector, um, it's a way that will do automatic um, uh, security assessments over your AWS infrastructure. And so Amazon just released this whole new product line where um, if you have an Amazon um, uh, uh, you know, server or whatever, it'll actually inspect your machines looking for configuration flaws or vulnerabilities or things that, that may, be, um, may be issues. And what's interesting is a lot of the, um, the industry has moved more towards those commoditized services or what we call puppy mills, right? And um, it's a horrible term, right? But, but puppy mills are, are organizations that... that Literally, you know, we'll hire somebody to perform vulnerability scans and come out to your infrastructure and go and do something around, you know, a basic vulnerability scan that's being masqueraded as a pen test. And there is a reason for that industry because there isn't enough talent out there. So companies are like, hey, I need to go to the experts. And the experts are these big companies. Their names are everywhere. I see them on billboards. I see them in magazines. They must be experts. And these external entities, you know, go for the profit line, right? It's, it's, it's. It's a, it's a business thing for them. So they're like, hey, I can hire you know, 50 junior people, and I can build them out as 50 senior people because the InfoSec industry is so messed up right now with talent. And we'll give them these things, and this is what happens. And so the puppy mill um, organizations are kind of farming out these types of services, and the companies get these reports, and they're crap. Um, and they focus on the basic type of thing. And then basics aren't, aren't a bad thing. But we can only go this route so long. And a lot of the reasons why we're in the situations that we're at today is because of these types of, types of companies. We are in these types of situations because we're not doing quality services, both on the inside and the outside, because we don't have the people to do it. And uh, John Strand said something that I really like, and, and John's somebody that, that I admire and respect. He's a really good dude. And he said, I do believe this industry is headed for a crash. And what he was talking about is that you know, the, the services out there, the companies that are doing um, things uh, in, in ways of puppy mills, the commoditized services, can only go for so long. There's going to be a massive crash that focuses on the industry itself. And, and the ones that are doing the right things, and I'm not saying that's, that's anybody um, at all. I'm just saying that the folks that are trying to, to focus on skill and focus on building security within companies and, and making them better will survive, but you will see a crash. And, and I like to use PCI as an example. I'm actually a QSA, by the way. I don't, do, I don't really do like assessments or anything. I just like having the, the, the little title so I can talk to people about PCI. I really can't sit through an audit. I'm really not good at that. I like just breaking into things. Um, but you know, the PCI stuff is an interesting uh, topic because I used to make fun of PCI all the time. You know, oh, yeah, they're PCI compliant, right, which means they're secure. But PCI did something with PCI 3 that I thought was really noble and really awesome. But it should show you where we're moving to as an industry. With PCI 2 versus PCI 3, PCI 2, literally your scope for a pen test was anything. Like you could hire a puppy mill company or you can hire a company and do anything you wanted to. There was no real definition. It just said that you had to be reputable. 
right? And I used to make fun of PC all the time for that because, like, hey, if you're a reputable company, does that mean, you know, um, my, uh, my cousin who is, you know, studying computer science and knows how to run Nessus, he's good for a, for a, a, a pen test, he's a, he's a reputable person. They never classified what that really meant. Now, with PCI 3, they changed that around. They said, hey, you need to follow one of these standards or services, like, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the penetration testing execution standard. They actually mentioned one of the standards that I helped create, and Nickerson and all those other guys, we, and Stefan, we all helped create that standard, and they referenced that as, as an actual method, which was really cool to see. And so they actually changed the definition to say anything that you can hack from to get to credit card data, you need to now actually assess that part. Now, companies now are freaking out because of that, but it's a good example of, of how the industry is changing. PC actually changed their wording, created a huge storm for companies, and now you actually have to do legitimate pen tests. Now, those can be defeated. So if you look at that, we can change things. Um, you know, as an individual, as a person, or as an or as a, as a um, industry, we can actually change things um, that actually go about. For me, red team and blue team working together is one of those, those things that changes things. Um, you know, as, as an offensive person myself, I learned so much working with people that are on the defense. Um, and I'll show you an example that I, I released uh, um, a, a tool here um, that kind of works together to make things easier. But um, the red team and blue team working together for me is, is one thing that I find extremely promising. Uh, when I go on an engagement and I'm breaking into something, to see how people defend better is awesome. And I learn ways of getting around that too, which is phenomenal. So it's like, you know, catch 22 for me, which is great. Um, but the blue team, you know, doesn't necessarily understand the offensive types of attacks that are out there. So if you're on the blue side and you can actually figure things out and how we're attacking, you become a lot better as, as, a, uh, as a company you can actually um, focus on things. And it just sharpens your skills. I mean, for me as a um, person that's going into an environment um, to understand um, something I'm going after, having the skills um, of the team to understand what I'm going after works really well. Now I want to show you something here really quick. If you're not familiar with this tool, I heavily recommend it. And is anybody here a pen tester on the offense? Got quite a few. That's great. If you're not, a way to learn really well. That's not supposed to happen. That's fine. So if you're not familiar, I released a tool uh, recently called the Pen Testers Framework, and it's great for uh, folks that want to learn on the defense and the types of tools that you have, as well as the, um, the offense as well. As I, I'm sure everybody's familiar with Kali Linux, right? And Kali is a, a great distribution framework. The biggest thing for us um, in pen testing is our tools, right? Our tools of our trade, how we actually attack, making sure that we have the latest and greatest and updating. The biggest issue that I have um, with, with package distributions is keeping things up to date and centrally in a way that I can understand and I can use. And so I created a module framework called the Pen Testers Framework, and you can get it from GitHub. It's just github.com slash trustedsec, and you'll see PTF there. Um, and, and it follows a very similar um, uh, uh, syntax and method towards Metasploit, which ever, a lot of us are familiar with. And what it is is a, it's a modular framework where you can easily add tools. Like if you want to add your own tool, if it's on the defensive side, to write a module for PTF takes about three minutes. Uh, so I created a whole programming language behind PTF so that it makes it easy for you to do. You don't need to be a programmer or anything like that in order to go through it. And what you do is to run PTF. You just type PTF, dot four slash PTF. And what it'll do is it'll actually go out to the internet and look for the newest version of PTF and automatically pull it down with all the latest tools and everything else that you need to. Okay, so it grabs the latest version of PTF. And once you're inside, notice here I just, I just released version 123. Uh, that's actually not... Uh, the way I intended it is not one, two, three, but um, I just released it literally um, this morning. Uh, but it supports uh, multiple operating systems. So, for example, if you're using Ubuntu, Fedora, Debian, um, uh, supports uh, a few other ones too. I think like SE Linux and a few others. Well, SE Linux isn't distro, but um, supports a lot of different configuration types um, and different distributions based off of that. Uh, supports Mint, uh, a few other ones. But, anyways, um, what it is, is the way to install all of your tools um, on your uh, infrastructure, make them the way that you want to, and literally keep you up to date with the latest and greatest. And why I say by the latest and greatest, um, most of the tools, if you don't know this or not, update almost daily. Uh, especially things like Metasploit, the Social Engineer Toolkit, um, all of those actually um, uh, update on a regular basis. And if you're using a lot of the package distributions out there, um, they don't update for weeks, months, sometimes longer than that. So you're usually running um, a, a, you know, a type of, of, of framework that's going to be out of date or whatnot. So I pull everything from, from different distributions. And right now, I have a total of 68 tools um, that are out there. So if you just do show modules, 
This will show you all the tools that are there, that are installed, um, that you can install. But the easiest way to do everything is just use modules install all. And what this will do is, let's just say you have a basic version of Ubuntu or a basic version of, of Fedora or whatnot. Um, as soon as you run this command here, it'll literally install every single tool that's inside of its, its um, distribution package and its modules. And it'll pull it, and then if you run that again after it's done installed, if you run that again, it'll automatically update them all for you. So you can keep all of your tools up to date real time, uh, really easy to do, and it, you know, it's, it's really, um, really pretty, pretty quick. So if I just go and run this, it'll go and pull everything and it'll automatically install it and do everything. And I'll let this run in the background because it's going to take a second. Um, but even big tools like Metasploit, everything else, it'll automatically structure everything. And if you're familiar with, like, um, everybody uh, familiar with uh, Backtrack when it came out, right? One thing I loved about Backtrack that I put back into here is the pen testing directory. So if you went to pen test, you know, you had different tools that you weren't familiar with or you hadn't used before. You can just break them out into different uh, categories. And let's just say I'm on my exploitation phase of a pen test. Well, if I go to exploitation, I got all my tools, you know, configured there real time that I can use for exploitation. Maybe I'm not familiar with comics or, uh, you know, JBoss Autopone or something like that. Um, so I want to take a look at those. Um, automatically get to go into those directory structures and kind of use it. Uh, but you don't have to go in there. Like, it, it actually builds launchers um, all, anywhere you want to. So if I want to run, you know, MSF console, it'll automatically build launchers, everything, um, you know, for you real time. So you, don't, you can, you know, launch them in, in and out of your applications. But to actually um, write a quick module for PTF, it's super easy. If I go to exploitation, let's just say I use this uh, SE toolkit. All you need to do is create a Python file inside of whatever you want to. Let's just say it's intelligence gathering or post-exploitation or whatever. Uh, you just create a new Python file. It'll dynamically import that into um, PTF. And the syntax is pretty easy. You know, the author of the module itself, so who actually made the module, the description of the tool. I support uh, Git, SVN, and file pools. Uh, file pools are like, you know, hey, there's a, it, it, they're not using some sort of, um, you know, version repository. So it'll actually go out to the site, pull the latest one, and it'll do a, a difference to see if there's any changes, and then actually um, install those for you. Uh, the actual location itself, where you want to pull the repository, and then any um, specific uh, uh, requirements. So, if, you know, for Fedora, for example, you know, those are the requirements for Fedora. Debian, those are the requirements for Debian. Where do you actually want to go and install it at? And then there's something called after commands, uh, which, you know, a lot of tools you have to run, like, you know, dot forward slash configure, make, make install, or do some sort of, you know, things afterwards in order to make sure you install it. So after it's done pulling the files and everything, you can be like, okay, hey, I do dot, you know, configure, you know, make, make install. And then, you know, after that, it'll go and run those through after it does an installation every time. And then launchers are just, you know, hey, what do I need to type when I want to run my own tool, uh, you know, inside of, of the toolkit itself? So if I want to, you know, go here, type SE toolkit, it'll automatically go and launch those. So it's a really easy way of, of keeping your tools up to date. It's something that I use regularly um, every day in a, on an individual pen test. And as you can see here, it's going through different modules, checking for different changes. So, I mean, you know, I updated this morning, so it's probably not going to be much. But, you know, it uh, also has a, a shelter, which is a, a way of um, doing a lot of obfuscation around uh, antivirus. But uh, it'll go through all the tools and make sure they're up to date, automatically rebuild them for you, and kind of handle everything, which is neat. So overall, um, you know, our focus in the industry, I think, really needs to change from focusing on automation to more the skill piece. And, and, and leveraging automation isn't a bad thing. Um, you know, having things to help us and augment us is going to be great. But for me personally, the, the piece around detection and detecting attacks is really important to us. And so, you know, if we focus on detection, focus on, um, you know, doing the things the right way and actually building the skills, we'll be highly successful. Standardization is one of the biggest things. The deviations that we see in most companies are what kills them. You know, uh, a weak password or a default password that then exposes everybody out there, or a misconfiguration in a certain cases, or passwords that are just really terrible. Um, those are the types of things we need to standardize upon. And you know, for defense, I wanted to put a couple slides in here that that were things that that I've seen work and stop me a lot in a lot of cases. Um, the randomization of, of local admin accounts is a huge one. If you, you know, if, if I compromise one workstation, I'm able to move from that one workstation to others, that's a problem. If you stop that, you randomize the local admin accounts or disable the local admin accounts, that's a big deal. Um, and I don't know if you know this or not, but if you actually have the group policy setting in Windows and, and Server uh, 2008 or above around, um, you know, disable the local admin account, I don't know if you know this or not, but that doesn't actually work. 
you have to have another admin account in there for that to actually work and actually for it to disable it. So if you actually hit select the group policy, disable local admins, your local admin account is still active and valid on there. So you actually have to have a second admin account in order for you to be able to disable the default admin account because they don't want you to accidentally lock yourself out, which really sucks. Um, but most of the time people complain like, oh, well, hey, if we disable local admins and it gets just joined from the domain or whatever, I can't hit it. I don't know if you noticed or not, but if you reboot in safe mode, you can, uh, it automatically re-enables the local admin account and you can then do your servicing for that. So it's actually a good one. But randomizing is just as good. Uh, rotating domain admin accounts uh, are really good. And, and here's another thing I don't understand too. Why are you having domain admin accounts log into anything other than domain controllers? Your domain admin account should only be logging in domain, domain controllers themselves and then having you know, uh, admins over servers as a different group. If I don't have a domain admin account that I can hack on another member server, I'm not going to get access to your domain controllers. Those are usually pretty well locked down. Um, so those are you know, key concepts. Uh, if you're not familiar with Emmet, I uh, really heavily recommend. Uh, there are ways of circumventing it, but it's really difficult. Um, it's called the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit. It's a free tool for Microsoft. Um, and what it does is it actually looks at a lot of the um, exploitation techniques that we use today, and it stops them uh, pretty good. Like, uh, for example, like return-oriented programming or ROP. It looks at methods for that and tries to disable that and disallow it from, from actually executing. Um, a lot of the different methods for exploitation it, uh, you can use. And what's great about Emmet, and it's really like kind of transparent in the background, and you only whitelist things that you want to. But I'd heavily recommend for like perimeter stuff, um, like you know, putting in like IAS, um, you know, uh, uh, over that process, or you know, common things like Adobe, Java, Office documents, things like that. It's very easy to to deploy. Uh, App Locker is built into group policy. There's two things you can do with an app locker um, that have stopped me before in the past. One is um, if you have good separation of admin accounts versus your user accounts. Um, so for example, your users aren't running as local admins. Do users ever need to run PowerShell? Ever? No, right? So disallow PowerShell from running from app locker, and now all of a sudden you've stopped like 90% of my exploitation techniques that I use. And that's a really easy fix. That's like a two second thing that you can do within app locker. Um, the second one is disallowing executables from temp. Most malware writes to temp or, or um, you know, all users or things like that, disallowing executables from there. Uh, network segmentation is a key concept, obviously. Um, focusing on detection capabilities, um, removing basic attack vectors, um, like defaults and things like that are all, all good ways. So those are key things that, that stop me as an attacker that really make it difficult for me as, uh, to, to get into other systems. So overall, I mean, I think we're getting better um, as an industry. I mean, if you look at... 10 years ago to now, I mean, I've never seen the type of adoption we've had um, in security that we do now. I mean, it's, it's wonderful to see, it's awesome to see, it's cool to see this industry going crazy and spawning and going different ways. And, uh, you know, I, having folks that are just coming out of college and hold, hold dedicated programs towards information security, it's a, it's a really cool time uh, to be experiencing all this. And I'm really excited. And I think we're getting better um, overall as an industry. We just have to be really careful about the ways that we take ab about it. And if we continue to invest millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars into security and we continue to see breaches and breaches and breaches and breaches and breaches, we're gonna be laughed upon. It's gonna be one of those things that we're not gonna be a very successful industry in the future. Right now there's an immediate need for us, um, but that can definitely change as, as time grows. Um, but that's really all I had. I really appreciate you having me out here at BrewCon and uh, hopefully you learned something new. And uh, if, you know, if you ever have any questions, feel free to ping me. I'm always at uh, Hacking Dave, and uh, you can always email me. It's just uh, DaveK at DerbyCon.com. Uh, but happy to answer any questions that you guys have, and I appreciate you know, all you folks having me out here. Thank you.